Hey, yo, this is Dave from TheNewYorkBudget.com. Texarkana, where you at? Joe plays board games all the time. OG still works the daily grind. Roundtable views don't always align, but help financial peace of mind. Suzanne's HR skills for the win. Doug is in Mom's cookie tin. PK's attacking Jim again. All on stacking Benjamins. Stack, stack, stack. Stacking Benjamins. Stack, 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 stack. Stacking Benjamins. Kicking it all the way from the 212 to the 903 430. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. Hey everyone, from me to you, happy Friday. Let's celebrate the start of a weekend with a fantastic roundtable discussion, shall we? On today's show, from the Million Dollar Plan podcast, USA Today contributor Pete the Planner. Also, from the Money Peach podcast and blog, Chris Peach. And from the Afford Anything podcast and award-winning blog, Paula Pant. But that's not all. On today's Friday FinTech segment, we'll introduce you to Ryan Kuhn and Rentolutions. Ever think about becoming a landlord? Ryan's here to help you get rid of all those random spreadsheets and manage properties like a pro. And here he is, a guy who's always ready for the weekend, Joe Saul Seahawk. Also, I'm ready for a break from the basement. Hey, everybody, I am Joe Saul Seahawk, Average Joe Money on Twitter. Welcome to June. Can you believe it's June already? That's just crazy. But we're going to pop open June with a fantastic show today and i can't wait to get right to it you know the first thing i can't wait for though is to get you to magnify money because if you head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money you know what you're going to find you're going to find out just how easy it is to navigate in fact i'm going to do this right now stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money why do we do that we do that so that the sponsor knows that you came through our link but there right across the top it says compare the best offers for and when you hover it says balance transfers, cash back rewards, 0% interest credit cards, low interest credit cards, checking accounts, savings accounts, CD rates, personal loans, student loan refinance, credit monitoring, identity theft, budget apps, auto loans, student loans. It's crazy. And like we do every week here, let's take a look at savings account rates. And I just click on get personalized offers, scroll down, and we're still at 1.3, guys. Dollar Savings Direct and Bank Purely, just like we were last week. $1 minimum balance, it says. And they both get an A grade for their fine print score. I really like this idea of the fine print score. Hey, so whether you are looking to play the rewards game because you pay off your credit cards every month, you're looking to get out of debt, or you're looking for better financial products, the place to compare, ditch, switch, and save is Magnified Money. StackyBenjamins.com forward slash Magnified Money. And... We haven't mentioned this much lately. We've mentioned a bunch of books. And if you head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash Amazon, remember that Amazon gives us a little thank you when you use our link. We can't see who bought the stuff, but we get a little thank you for you using our link. So the next time you head to amazon.com, use this link, stackybenjamins.com forward slash Amazon and bada boom, bada bing, you'll get your same cool deals through Amazon and you'll also help out the Stacky Benjamin show. Let's help out your move into the weekend with a phenomenal round table. Love these guys. Pete the Planner, one of my favorite people. Chris Peach, how can you not like Chris Peaches? That guy is annoyingly happy so often. <laughs> he just is Mr. Positive. If I could be as positive as Chris Peach, it'd be amazing. So uh, the very funny Pete the Planner and Chris Peach joining Paula Pant. Let's get to it. All right, let's walk across the basement here to my dad, Shortwave, and fire this baby up for another amazing Friday show. And we're going to start off the fun in Phoenix, Arizona. I believe he's in Phoenix, uh, where Chris Peach from the Money Peach podcast and blog joins us. Are you in Phoenix? I am in Phoenix. I'm in the wonderful cold city of Phoenix, Arizona. Cold? What are you talking about cold? It's not cold here. It's already 104 <laughs> degrees today. It's like, are you kidding me? Cold. I know. Right. 
Yeah. You know what's funny? I always want to pronounce it Fahonix. If you did you ever see that commercial? I think it was a UPS commercial where the guy takes a package in and says, I want to send this to Fahonix. And the person goes, What are you talking about? He goes, Fahonix, Arizona. And the person goes, Oh, you mean the UPS person goes, Oh, you mean Phoenix. And the guy starts laughing. <laughs> oh, that's very funny. No, seriously, just send it to Fahonix. And so whenever anybody says Phoenix, I think Fahonix. Is that bad? No, I mean, it's pretty common. I mean, it's spelled Fahonix. Is it common? I'm not the only one. So tell yes. everybody about the Money Peach podcast and about the Money Peach blog, because you've got a great thing going there. Yeah. So for the last couple of years now, we've had the Money Peach blog and personal finance website with a little bit different spin on it, because I always tell people I'm not from the financial world. I'm actually a firefighter who started this blog. And so it's a kind of a different flavor, I would say, of personal finance, because I'm not from the financial world. And then we started the podcast, Joe, about... Ooh, almost a year ago now, and started off mostly money talk, and we kind of transferred into this entrepreneurship world, and it's been fun. So every week now we have um, a different entrepreneur from all over the world telling their story, and it's been interesting to say the least. It's been a lot of fun, though. I, I've learned a lot myself. That's what I like. I mean, part of the fun of being a podcaster is just hearing everybody's story like your story, which is, is so fun to listen to. Well, I'm glad you could make it tonight. You know, another guy... I'm glad can make it tonight. And another guy, too, not only do we say we need Chris Peach on more, we definitely need Peter Dunn on more, a.k.a. Pete the Planner from the Million Dollar Plan Podcast, USA Today contributor. What's going on, Pete? Well, I'm the last person you would want to see in a firefighter's shirtless calendar. I can tell you that. <laughs> I am from the finance world, and I'm sorry to give everyone that visual. I'm here in lovely Indianapolis, which... Locals call it nap town, but now the city is saying for tourism reasons, we shouldn't say nap town because people think it's sleepy, but like all the cool, we just want to feel cool. So we say nap town because it feels hip. Turns out, Joe, we're not supposed to do that. I'll remember, don't call it nap town, but I love Indianapolis, man. Indy's a fun town. It is. I mean, Indy five, month of May means Indy 500 around here. So uh, traffic stinks and a, a lot of uh, B and C list celebrities around town. So, you know. It's a good time. Well, well, my favorite A-list celebrity is uh, Pete the Planner. Tell us what's tell us what's what's going on at the Million Dollar Plan podcast. Uh, going well. You know, we take one person every week and dig through their financial. We change their name. That's an important factor, uh, everybody, because we don't want to uh, compromise anyone's identity. So we we change people's names. We give them the exact day they'll be a millionaire based on their current habits. And then we show them how to make some changes and move that day up. And I got called a, uh, what did I call I got called by a random person on Twitter today. What did they call me? A huckster. I got called a huckster on Twitter. So needless to say, this is the worst day of my life. <laughs> yeah. Cause you worry about what random people on Twitter say. It's tough. So, uh, I'll be crying. It, it, it is tough, right? I'm, I'm sure you will be. And from Las Vegas, the one person that you hear every week on the show from the afford anything podcast, it's Paula Pant. You know, I was going to say, I love taking naps. So some places called nap town, that, I'd see that as a positive. Totally. Yeah, Paula's like, I'm in. Really? How do I get yeah. more of that? Right. I can I can go there and take a nap? Like, I get, do I get like a full eight hours of sleep and also nap time? Because I would totally, I'd be all over that. Well, you're from Cincinnati originally, so that's not that far away. I am. Yeah, we're, uh, we're former neighbors. I grew up in Cincinnati. I think the, the so people called it. Well, actually, no, I take that back. Nobody called it Sin City, even though a name like Cincinnati you'd think would lend itself to that. No one called it Sin City. And now I live in Las Vegas, the place that calls itself Sin City. So ah. go figure. How did, we are way off the reservation now, but how the heck did Cincinnati become the whole, the whole uh, flying pig thing? Where did that come from? Oh, I believe, and you're going to have to fact check me on this because I might be completely blowing, blowing smoke up your butt. I believe that the former name of the city was something to the effect of Porkopolis. And it was basically, Cincinnati was uh, it settled originally by um, German immigrants who, uh, many of them earned a living from pig farming, pork farming. Gotcha. And so it had a, a really strong pork industrial heritage. And so that's where the flying pig thing came from. Well, that's the, you know, we don't need to fact check you, Paula. I mean, if people, if people <laughs> have listened to the show, there's no facts to share anyway. So we're good. <laughs> yeah. Right. I, I might be totally wrong about that. Like what you're hearing is basically the urban legend that got passed down to me as a 
resident of Cincinnati that I never actually bothered to look into whether or not that was like accurate. But I can tell you that, you know, in terms of like the experience of a kid growing up in Cincinnati, that's what I always heard about my city. So yeah, if it felt accurate, that was good enough for you. (laughs) It feels factual. Right, right. All right, guys, let's uh, move into the, because everybody's wondering, when are you going to start talking about money? So let's do that now. We're going to start off with the Mike blog. The only three financial rules you need to get rich. This is written by Christy Rakasi. And uh, uh, Pete, we'll start with you. There's there's three rules here. Number one, pretend your paycheck's 20% lower. Two, accept builder costs, not loser ones. Maybe we'll have to explain what that is in a little bit. Number three, put away 15% toward retirement. So on the million dollar plan podcast uh, do you just go over those three rules because that's all you really need well they're the only three real rules joe i mean that's <laughs> the title of the the blog you know what's rough about stuff like this and and i would guess we're all guilty of it on, on this podcast today is when you're writing a post you're trying to, to come up with like this reasonable easy way to say something but then it comes off as absolute by saying something like the only three rules <laughs> to become a millionaire. It's all right. I mean, the reality is though, uh, if you're at or below living wage, this thing falls completely apart. And if you live in an expensive city like uh, uh, Manhattan or San Diego or Boston, then this falls completely apart. But if you're in the Midwest or the South, you're good to go. Well, let's talk about that a little bit, Chris. Of these three rules, which one do you think is the biggest factor in becoming a millionaire? I'm going to say rule number three, putting 15% of your pay towards retirement. I mean, if if I look back and I was 18 years old and somebody would have forced this into my small brain and said, hey, you need to stick away 15 percent away into your retirement. And I never got used to having that 15 percent. Like I started off 18 years old at high school and I just started putting away that money. Life would look so much different today. So that's I I would say out of those three, that's the one that sticks home with me. But I'm looking at these, Joe, these are. I mean, no, nothing standing out as far as, oh, my gosh, this is overwhelming. I say this. These three things are going to put you in right around the, the average category. I think you could do better than these three. But 15 percent is not bad. I, I bet, Paula Pant, you agree with that emotion. The emotion that this isn't bad, but it could be better. Yeah, that this puts you in average category. Well, I think the unfortunately, the average savings rates of <laughs> that's a good like, point. Yeah. Let's put the it this savings way. Rates of the average American is not something to aspire to. How about we'll this one? Put it, how about this? That way, Paula. Yeah. How about this one, mm-hmm. Paula? This this makes you competent. This puts you in the ballpark. Correct. Yes. If you assume that you want to have a normal middle class life and work for forty five years, and you know, and not retire early and not do any of those, um, yeah, yeah, you'll be reasonably competent if you follow these three things. That said, I also hate the headline because. Saying that these are the only three financial rules you need to get rich is number one, untrue. And number two, it downplays how much goes into financial planning when you say that you, oh, you only need to know these three things. And number two, two of these things seem to be contradictory, or at least I don't, I don't, they haven't explained this, right? So number one, pretend your paycheck is 20% lower. And then number three is set aside 15% of your pay towards retirement. So are they saying you should save 20% of your income and put 15% of that towards retirement and the other 5% towards other expenses? Or are they saying that you should put 15% away towards retirement and then save 20% of what's left over? They don't even explain that. Maybe it's pretend your paycheck's 20% lower after you've saved the 15%. Maybe, but we're guessing. Like, yeah, we shouldn't the article explain that? Yeah, I want to ask about something else, which is this, Pete. Except builder costs, not loser ones. What are they talking about there? I don't know. I, I think it basically says it's sort of in Paula's territory. Like, have rental properties, have passive income. I think that's what they want you to invest in, as opposed to uh, being in cars and stuff. I, that's the, that's the way I would take it. Yeah, maybe it says uh, rather than owing back money plus interest, see if you can pay in cash. Don't take out unnecessary debt. Chris, you were a guy at one point, I think, that was, you were in debt up to your eyeballs, weren't you? Yeah, that's right, Joe. I was stupid with money. Is that what you're saying? I I, I didn't say that. (laughs) No, no, I I definitely was. I'm pretty open about it. I was deeply in debt up to my eyeballs at a young age. I never learned any of these things about money. So when I hear accept builder costs, not loser ones, if you're somebody that's stepping into the arena of trying to learn about personal finance, that just seems confusing. Yeah seems real confusing. I think there's a better way to say it. Um, But yeah, so don't borrow money and pay interest. Instead, 
invest in things that go up in value. I think that's pretty much what they're saying, but they didn't. I think you can also rationalize that. I remember my first computer when I was in college and I was horrible with money then was a computer that I rationalized. I would have called it a builder cost because I'm building my future because I need this computer. And then I used it to play video games and not do my homework. So that's tough. How much how much time, Pete, do you guys spend on getting people out of debt on your show? That seems to be an epidemic in America. Uh, quite a bit. I mean, it goes to that idea of just moving your net worth forward. I think so often we are told to invest and save. And, and by the way, we should. But then we ignore the idea that the interest is chipping away at us. So I'd say 40 percent of the time there's a debt component, but it's not always credit card debt. I mean, it can be a really bad mortgage. Like, I mean, there are bad mortgages. I, I would say the average mortgage is a bad mortgage. Um, so, yeah, de- that's always a factor. And of course, getting people out of high interest, really long car loans on a depreciating asset, that's never a good time either. Well, everybody's wondering why you say that the average mortgage is a bad mortgage. Well, how about another history lesson? Like, uh, if Paul is going to hit us with porkopolis. Uh, I'm I think those <laughs> too. So decades ago, the average mortgage was four years long, right? I mean, it was the idea that you watch the opening ceremonies of the first Olympics. And then by the time the next Olympics had rolled on, you're having a party because your mortgage is paid off. And then it, 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 it sort of creeped up. And right before the recession in 2008, we were about to have a 40-year interest-only mortgage as the most popular mortgage in America. I tend to think people stretch what they can afford with a 30-year mortgage, thus making it a bad mortgage. That the, the fact that a 30-year mortgage lets you buy more often causes people to stretch and buy something they can't afford. Yeah, Paula, last word on this piece before we put this one to bed. I completely agree. I think a 30-year mortgage is bullshit. I mean, as an investor, yeah, I've got some, but for the average homeowner, if you have to have 30... Now, I guess, let me amend that statement a little bit. Given the fact that 30 years in our society is standard, I absolutely see the value in running numbers and saying, hey, I can have a 30-year mortgage at a 3.5% interest rate. uh, And so therefore, you know, it doesn't make sense for me to pay this off quickly. Like the, the should I pay off my mortgage versus should I invest question is a separate issue. What I'm referring to when I say that the 30 year is BS is the fact that there are many people who use the availability of 30-year mortgages to purchase a home that they would not be able to afford if they were to try to pay for it as a 15-year mortgage. Not saying that you should necessarily always pay for your home as a 15-year, but that you should be able to do so if you choose. Does that distinction make sense? Yep. I think that's a great place to leave it, too. That's fantastic. Piece number two we're going to talk about today comes to us from Fox Business, and this is uh, written by Selena Marangian from uh, The Motley Fool. Seven facts you didn't know about the S&P 500. Chris Peach, let's start with you. Any of these facts about the S&P 500, 500 biggest companies in America, any of these surprise you? Yeah, actually, you know, one did surprise me. when they're In the very beginning, they're talking about dividends. So they mentioned here how the S&P 500 dividends, which is about 2%, actually pays out more than some of these other companies that you would never have thought that, like Apple or Starbucks or Walt Disney. And when I saw that, I I thought that's definitely interesting. I'm actually glad you sent me that article because that stood out to me. And that was pretty much it. I mean, it's, it's pretty cut and dry. Yeah, Pete, any of these? You've been in the business for quite a while. Any of these points about the S&P 500 surprise you? Nothing really surprised me, but I would say for even a pretty solid investor, some of these things would be surprising. The fact that the S&P 500 is market weighted as opposed to price weighted. I think that's an important distinction. And then there's the the one that a lot of people wrap their arms around and that the financial industry loves to argue with. And then that's that The S&P 500 outperforms most mutual funds. I mean, sit back and have a drink and watch two financial people argue about that, and you've got yourself a nice little (laughs) Tuesday. Right. Uh, Paula, your favorite thing, I think, is down at the bottom of this piece, and that's that it's easy and inexpensive to invest in. (laughs) Well, inexpensive is relative. There are times when the S&P 500 can be expensive in, in terms of if stocks are generally overvalued, but it is certainly easy to invest in. I'm at low fees. Oh, yeah. Low fees are awesome. Yeah, that's one of the things that I love about index fund investing in general. I mean, Joey and I were talking about this earlier today. If you go with a a low fee broker like Vanguard or Schwab, 
uh, or Fidelity, and you buy passively managed index funds, I mean, heck, you can't go any lower fee than that. As your portfolio grows, because I know that you're primarily an index investor, do you see yourself getting away from the S&P 500 a little bit? In other words, maybe putting some in S&P value instead and distinguishing that you want value stocks or S&P growth or moving down more to the S&P mid cap or, you know, splitting it up to become a little bit more technical as your portfolio gets bigger? You know, I'm actually moving in the opposite direction. So a few years ago, I got really into asset allocation, the the kind of thing that you get into in your 20s, got super into asset allocation and uh, became uh, kind of geeked out for a while on like small cap value stocks and emerging markets and frontier markets and this and that and the other. And uh, as I've gotten older slash as my portfolio has grown, I've actually been stepping back into like simpler and simpler. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, exactly. I'm, with you. I, I'm the same way. Are you really? Like, I didn't see. I was going to, I was going to come to you next, Pete, because I thought that you and I'd be on the same train on this, which is the bigger your portfolio is, the more proper asset allocation matters and being on the efficient frontier matters. Yeah. I mean, to some degree, I mean, it's definitely diversified, but it is a lot... I focus more on the money I'm putting in than the money that's in. Like, and I find if we only have so much focus that the average person, and I'm not suggesting I am or not the average person, but the average person needs to focus on how you're funding it, not necessarily what the funds are doing. Now, I, I, that is the debate within investment advice versus personal finance. All three, all four people on this call here today, we really focus on making sure people are putting gas in the car. And I think the investment managers of America are, are saying, where's the car driving? So uh, I try to practice what I preach and put more focus on uh, the money going in. Paula, are you and Pete, uh, brother and sister, separated at birth? <laughs> Maybe. I mean, Cincinnati, <laughs> Indianapolis. Could, could be. Could be. Could have happened. When you're investing money, Chris, how do you go? Do you go into the S&P 500 also? You keep it simple? You know, Joe, I've been doing about a 50-50 split. So we do about half of what this article is talking about into index funds and ETFs and just keep it very, very simple. And then I have about 50% of our equity in with an advisor who is very, very, very active. And it's funny, over the last probably five years, it's gone back and forth. It hasn't really been one or the other that's really been leading the way. And that's what I'm kind of looking for is which one am I going to start sticking with? And it's been kind of a, you know, back and forth strategy. So that's what we've been doing now. And I like it that way. Does the advisor know you're judging McJudgerson, like judging everything that they do against your your passive ETF portfolio? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So you can imagine I hear from him (laughs) when he knows he's doing well. And then it's like crickets when, you know, when it's the other way around. So. And, and I use that, of course, you know, I mean, it's it's competition a little bit if, with your own money. It's pretty fun. I should mention, I am actually 400 percent of my money is in Bitcoin. And it would be <laughs> really, really unfair if I didn't disclose that. <laughs> Congratulations. You become independently wealthy in the past, uh, what, 14 days. And I'm still doing this podcast. Right. Oh my God. That's great. That's because you love it here. Well, I was going to ask you, I don't know which companies you came up with, Pete, but where I started, it was funny, the stuff that Chris talks about, of calling your advisor when things are going well and hiding yeah. when they're not. I didn't necessarily do that, but I was told by my training manager at the big firm that I was with that you always have to massage what you're comparing your performance against. So when the portfolio was down or the market was down or I was getting my butt kicked, I would find a different index to compare things to. Did you get that same you get that same sales advice? Yeah, to some degree. I just remember, uh, and, and uh, what the heck? I mean, I remember seeing in like a money magazine, like the classic Dreyfus ad from like the uh, late 90s, early 2000s or giant lion on it. And it just got the returns are in like 40 point font. And then in eight point font, it says past performances. <laughs> past performance right. is not indicative of future performance. And then it's just like every time you talk to someone, you you have that same stupid conversation where you talk about your returns and then you quickly tell them, by the way, that means nothing. Yeah. Which, which by the way, Paula, is exactly why you focus on the money going in, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, you focus on whatever is within your locus of control. Yeah. And so your contributions are within your control to some extent. Deciding where those contributions will go, that is also within your control, although that arguably has a smaller impact than the contributions themselves, the size of the contributions themselves that you make. And then the actual returns that you get after you've made the contribution and made the decision about where it goes, that's outside of your control. 
I love conversations like this because I had no idea we were going to talk about this this long. I did have a question that I had posed to all of you ahead of time in my email when I sent these out, which is, what are some other cool facts that you know, maybe not about the S&P, but just about investments or financial planning in general that are pretty neat that you think a lot of people might not know? Chris, let's start with you. Any, uh, any cool facts to share that maybe a lot of our listeners might not know? Yeah, this is something that I remember I learned a couple of years ago was the Dow Jones Industrial Average had all industrialized companies in it. And I think the last one that came out was Alcoa Aluminum. And so it's where it came to where it is now. If you look, it looks totally different than it did pre-1970. So I thought that was, you know, that, that's something that a lot of people don't know. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, Pete, how about you? Uh, here's what I know, that a sixth grader in about 1989 could buy one share of Philip Morris stock because he knew a guy and it could uh, split a couple times and it could hook him on investing. So that's what I know, that a, a sixth grader in America could buy tobacco stocks and turn it into a career. And uh, I guess that's why I'm on the podcast. <laughs> Is it, well, that was you? <laughs> it was me. Yeah. I was buying tobacco stocks uh, in uh, the late 80s through a friend when I was like 12 years old, 11 years old. And my parents didn't see anything morally wrong with that, which would which would explain a lot about my upbringing. <laughs> so instead of buying cigarettes, you're buying cigarette companies. Yeah, let other people die. I'll just profit off. <laughs> That's of it. fantastic. Oh, Paula, Paula, tell us something we don't know. According to the internet, ninety percent <laughs> of all U.S. Uh, bills have at least some trace of cocaine on them. Really? Yes. Wow. <laughs> yes. So apparently somewhere between 90 to 94 percent of all bills in circulation carry traces of cocaine, partially because drug traffickers deal in cash. And so they deal with large amounts of cash that they're moving with their hands and partially because people roll up bills in order to snort coke. <laughs> so uh, so the lesson is either number one, wash all your money the second you get it. <laughs> or number two, if you like that, just go sniff your money. <laughs> I'm going to get a bunch of listeners who are all huffing money. Right. Our next iTunes review is, I got so high listening to Stacking Benjamins. It was amazing. <laughs> right. Oh, I love talking to these guys. Got to say a big thank you to everybody who's used our Amazon link. Remember, if you use stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Amazon, you end up at the same great Amazon.com, but... You help out the show. StackyBenjamins.com forward slash Amazon helps us a ton. You know what I'm going to do? Next week, I'm going to get back into the habit of talking about some of the things you crazy people buy because you buy some crazy stuff using our link. And I think we should call that out. But uh, for now, we're going to move into our Friday FinTech segment. You know, we have a lot of people ask us about real estate and what attracted me to Ryan and to Renolutions was the fact that when I was a financial planner, people would try to get into real estate and just managing properties is a pain in the butt. Number one, you got to keep it separate than your main stuff, you know, your regular household stuff. You also have to make sure that you have details where you can get them quickly. And whether it's finding somebody to rent the house or keeping track of the state of the house, whatever it is, you need all that one place. So when I heard about Ryan and about Renolutions, I said, we got to have them on. So that's what it does. And I think even if you are not yet in real estate, this might help you get started. So let's say hello to Ryan Kuhn and hear about Renolutions. And Ryan Kuhn from Renolutions joins us in the basement. Have a seat, man. How are you? I'm well, thanks. How are you, Joe? Good. I have an upfront question because we're going to talk about being a landlord here. Are you a landlord? I am. Okay. Yes. Okay. How many properties do you own? I've got a three unit building in Chicago. Was this a frustration that you had and you said, how come nobody's, nobody's making it easier for landlords or did you uh, see an opportunity in the marketplace? Where did the idea come from? Yeah, it very much came out of personal experience. Both my co-founder, Lawrence, and I, our families both had real estate investments. So when Lawrence and I both graduated from undergrad, uh, started earning some money, we decided to invest in properties ourselves. What we quickly realized that was being a busy professional and a part-time landlord was pretty painful between the different Excel spreadsheets, pen and paper, paper rent checks, and more. 
I mean, we were just spending way too much time managing these rental properties. Let's talk about a few of those things, those problems that landlords have, because I know we've got people that listen to the show that want to be a landlord, right? So you talk about the spreadsheets. What would you use a spreadsheet for? Yeah, we use spreadsheets both to track tenants who are interested in the property, as well as different rent checks and what payments were coming in and going out. What about tracking people that you work with? Uh, or do you do all the handiwork on your properties too? Yeah, so I do I do pretty much everything from finding the tenants, really? screening them, some of the maintenance. There are different things, you know, plumbing and electric that that it's better to work with a professional, but I tend to be very hands-on. Yeah, so you got all these kind of, I, I guess I'll call them half-ass systems, right? <laughs> where, where you're trying to, <laughs> you're trying to probably, and were you trying to hold down a job at the same time too? Exactly. You had kind of duct taped together <laughs> these different solutions, these different tools that weren't meant for managing rentals, but was doing that in addition to a full-time job working at an investment bank. Holy cow. Yeah. That's not just a nine to five, I think. That's right. Yeah. It's, the hours are unpredictable, can be quite long. So ultimately realized that just way too much time was going into the nuts and bolts of managing rentals. So let's talk about what you have. The site is called rentolutions.com. Walk me through it. When somebody starts using Rentolutions, what do they do? How does it work? Yeah. So Rentolutions, our goal is to help landlords with three things. We help the landlord find, screen, and keep great tenants. Because at the end of the day, that's really what makes up a successful rental business. You sure. need to find tenants to minimize vacancy so that you've got rental income coming in. You want to screen all your prospective tenants because letting someone who has been evicted or isn't financially secure rent out your unit, that can end up costing you a lot of money. And then the third thing that we help the landlord with is keeping the tenants. So once you've gone through all the hard work to find great tenants, you want to keep them around. When you are screening tenants, let's start there. So you're screening for tenants. How do you guys help people screen tenants? Yeah, so there's a couple ways. So the first is with a standardized rental application. So just making sure that the individual has enough income to cover the rent. So we typically encourage landlords to look for a tenant who makes three times the monthly rent amount. Okay. Then we also integrate with TransUnion so that the landlord can quickly and easily access credit reports, nationwide criminal background checks, and also eviction reports. Okay. As the landlord, it's really important to understand to get a full picture of who you're meeting with, who's going to be renting your unit for the next 12, 18, 24 months. Gotcha. So right on Rentolutions, you have a standardized contract? We do. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. so for the lease agreement, we actually have state-specific lease templates okay. that can be created, customized, and then signed electronically. I think, Ryan, that you guys probably recommend people still have an attorney look at that. Do you agree with that or no? Yeah, it... it we do recommend that an attorney takes a look at it. Although all of our contracts, all of the standard templates that we have, have been vetted by attorneys in the different markets. Gotcha. Okay. Because that's, uh, you know, you never know, right? What's going to happen. But I like that. So then once I've found my tenant, how do you help keep them? Yeah. So to keep tenants, there's really two things that you need to do as a landlord. And that's making things really convenient and being responsive. So on the convenience factor, about 80% of tenants still pay rent with a paper rent check, although 80% of them want to pay online. Right. So what we do is we make it really easy for tenants to set up automatic payments for their monthly rent amount. As the landlord, you can then get the payments deposited into whatever bank account you want. And then on the responsiveness, the other thing that tenants love is being able to submit maintenance requests through our platform so they can quickly snap a photo or a video of whatever maintenance issues going on and know that that'll be sent to the landlord. And that as the tenant, you can then track that maintenance request from start to finish. How does the landlord get that, Ryan? Do you get it as a text message, as an email? How do you receive notice that somebody went on and uh, requested help? Yeah, so it's an email that is sent automatically to the landlord. We also then follow up with the landlord uh, within a day or so if he or she hasn't looked at and responded to the maintenance request. 
Gotcha. Okay. Because like my bathtub is flooding and it won't turn off. Is kind of <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's kind of a big deal. <laughs> yeah. So how do you guys, well, I guess, I guess I should ask the elephant in the room, how much does it cost if somebody's a landlord and they want to use your solution? How much money does it cost for somebody to sign up? Yeah. Our platform is completely free for landlords with only one unit. Okay. We believe that landlords with one unit, if we provide them with a great experience, they may go out and buy a second unit or they may refer a friend to us. Uh, with two or more units, the monthly subscription fee starts at $25 a month. Okay. So that covers you for up to five units. And then it scales then based on the number of units that you're managing on the platform. Got it. And are there other ways that you guys make money? Do you make money if somebody has the rent checks go through you or anything like that? No. So we don't take anything off the top on, on rent checks. We do have a couple of partners, such as uh, State Farm, for example, who will compensate us if we, say, refer a renter over to them for renter's insurance. Got it. Okay. Well, and that's something that people really need. And we, we've talked about this before on the show that so many people don't have renter's insurance and you wonder why not. It's not like it's expensive and it's so worth it. Yeah. It only costs on average 12 bucks a month and it can cover not only the possessions in your unit, but can protect you from liability and can also protect your possessions if they're not in your apartment. You said that you partner with people like TransUnion when you're screening tenants. Is there an additional fee for that service at all? Yeah. So there is a, a small fee for the credit and credit criminal and eviction reports. Okay. But that fee is covered by the renter. Gotcha. So, okay. So we have the tenant cover that fee, which we also think is part of a good, thorough tenant screening process. Okay. If the person isn't willing to cover that cost, he or she's likely not either interested in your unit or B, probably isn't someone you want actually living there. Right. Which is the whole point of screening in the first place. Yep. Good stuff. So everything from online rental listings, I'm looking and through all the stuff that we talked about, 30,958 tenants right now, 26,000 landlords. Uh, how long has Renolutions been around? We've been around for about four years. Okay. We launched it in early 2013. Uh, Lawrence and I at that point left our full-time jobs. We were both passionate about solving this problem and helping landlords. So we actually taught ourselves how to code. Really? So we built the built the platform ourselves and have written all types of educational content. And this is really the space that we know and we love. Yeah, I was I was just about to say you've got some landlord guides which are also free and also the blog. Tell me about those a little bit. Landlord education, the Renolutions blog. Yeah. So what we found being do-it-yourself landlords ourselves, that there's really two major pain points or problems that landlords encounter. And the first is that there's a total lack of knowledge out there. So there's a lot of these get rich quick seminars out right. there that, that, that'll teach you how to, how much money you can make through real estate, but no one's actually out there helping you understand how do you manage the property? Things like what questions should you ask potential tenants or what can you do if rent is late? We've written all this really good long form content to help solve that problem. Then the second pain point that landlords have is that there are no tools out there that make the whole rental process easy. And that's what our platform is designed to do. Yeah, definitely. If somebody's thinking about being a landlord, I would just come here to the blog and to the landlord tools to check these out. And I think this tells you, you a ton of the stuff that you need to know. Ryan, so what's up next for you guys? Are you seeing yourself expand the platform? Are there any things uh, coming up in the near future that people would want to know about? Yeah. So for us, we think about it two ways. So first, there's 8 million individual landlords out there in the United States, and we want to continue serving more and more of them over time. The other thing that we've learned in the four years that we're doing this is that we don't today solve all of the problems that landlords face. So we look forward to continuing to invest in product. Uh, we've got a great team that's building beautiful software and areas that we think we're getting into next will be helping landlords better manage their finances, for example. So right now we help them track all the rent payments that are coming in and out. 
or coming in for the for the unit, but we don't yet have a great way to help them manage and track all the expenses. Gotcha. So that's an area that we want to get into next. Yeah, boy, and it'll it'll make it a lot easier then to you could even help them track ROI once you have that data in there too. Exactly. So as former finance nerds <laughs> ourselves, Lawrence and I are, are really excited about getting into that and helping people really analyze the profitability of each unit or each property. The site is called Rent Solutions. It's rentolutions.com. I'll have a link in our show notes at stackybenjamins.com. Ryan Kuhn, thanks for hanging out with us, man. Thanks a bunch, Joe. A big thanks again to Ryan for coming down to the basement. If you head to our show notes at Stacky Benjamins, we'll have a link for you to Rentolutions. Isn't that, it just, stay organized. And it doesn't have to be that you're an organized or unorganized person. You can be the most unorganized person in the world. And if you use the right tools, man, does it help. I found that for me. People, I'll tell you what, the whole team will tell you, I am not the world's most organized person. So I rely heavily on good tools. All right, let's get back to our, fa speaking of tools, <laughs> Let's get back to our conversation. Oh, they're going to be so mad at me that I said that. Uh, let's get back to Pete the Planner from the Million Dollar Plan podcast and, of course, USA Today contributor and Chris Peach from the Money Peach and the wonderful Paula Pant from Afford Anything. All right, let's move on to our final piece, <laughs> which comes to us from, I got to say, lately, my favorite place to hang out just because it's such a dorky blog, the Money-ish blog. This is the number one financial regret people have at every age. And Paula, we'll stick with you. The number one financial regret that people have at any age sounds like it's that they didn't have an emergency fund. Oh, well, according to this article... The number one financial regret of millennials is not having an emergency fund, whereas the regret of people who are older than millennials, Generation X, baby boomers, uh, the silent generation, are that they uh, didn't start saving for retirement earlier. Which makes me wonder, is it a function of generation or is it a function of age? You know, 20 years from now, will the number one regret of millennials also be not saving for retirement earlier? Yeah. Where do you think we come down on that, Chris? Well, first of all, why do millennials get such a bad name? I mean, it, the first thing you see in this article says millennials seriously need to stop doing this stupid thing with their money. <laughs> and I just look at this going, I'm kind of on the cusp of being a millennial. I think I'm like right at that age. And it kind of pisses me off <laughs> because <laughs> I feel like we are just getting attacked here. So I'm speaking on behalf of the millennials, if you're listening out there. So what was your question again, Joe? Because I'm just frustrated. <laughs> you're, like, hey, you're like, hey, back off. Yeah. Yeah, right. Now, uh, do you, uh, uh, what did I ask? I don't even remember what I asked. What did I ask? Paula, what did I ask? Oh, that the fact that millennials' biggest regret is not having enough saved for emergencies. Yes. Whereas every older generation, their regret is not having saved for retirement at an earlier age. Is that a function of the generation or is it a function of age? Yes. Oh, that's Paula's that's question. Great question. That's Joe, too. that's a great question, Joe. So I think that what, what it is, is, you know, if I go back to when I was in school, when I was in college, tuition was affordable. And so nowadays, graduates are graduating, the millennials are graduating with these incredibly high student loans. And so they're right up against the wall right when they start. And so it's hard for them to save for an emergency fund. It's hard for them to do anything with money because they come out of school, they're promised, oh, as soon as you graduate, you're going to have this great job lining up, making a lot of money. They graduate, they don't have that. They have all these people out there telling them, oh, you're a stupid millennial, you don't get it. And they're thinking, wait a second, we weren't we weren't given the same parameters here when we started. So I think it is generational because they're in a different situation than say 15, 20 years ago. But I think in 15 or 20 years, it's gonna be the same data saying, oh, millennials, these guys are idiots. They should have been saving 15% in retirement. So I think it's gonna transfer. We got two out of three. Mr. Dunn, what do you think? This is totally age-based. It is nothing different than that because my biggest regret uh, specifically it relates to the same thing. Oftentimes I dream about creating a time machine for the sole purpose of going back in time to punch the 25 year old me in the face <laughs> because I was doing all right. I was doing good and I, I was saving, but I really wasn't saving as much as I should, which would have made my life more interesting now. But the biggest mistake was 
I day traded in college. Like that was sort of my thing, which is makes sense coming from someone who, who bought tobacco stocks and, and, and profited from death. Uh, but I, I did that and I bought a car, a brand new car with cash the month I graduated from college. And I regret that immensely. I felt like the big baller at the time, but man, that was really stupid. Sinking all your money into the depreciating asset that made you look cool. Oh my God. I, but you know what? For about a month, I lived a cool guy's lifestyle. I just faded naturally because I'm a ginger after that. But <laughs> for a moment, it was pretty exciting. What, what kind of car? It was an Acura CL, a two-door Acura that was way too fast, which resulted in some traffic fines. Oh, that's not good. <laughs> and so did you have to sell your death stocks to pay the fine? Oh yeah! Oh, it definitely sold some. Uh, I sold some banking stocks, some death stocks. I mean, hell, what's the difference between those two? I sold them, and I bought a depreciating asset that almost killed me. So that's good. Excellent, Paula. How about you? You know, we just heard Pete's uh, biggest regret. Your biggest financial regret? Oh, I have so many of them. Not buying more houses when I could have. Like, man, not buying more houses back in 2011, 2012. Being too conservative. Oh, here's one. When I was much younger, I treated the stock market as though it was a high yield savings account. And I, so I thought that if I just threw money into mutual funds, it would go up at 8% a year. And then the market crashed and I found out the hard way that that was not the case. So yeah, that, that sucked. Like going through the recession and learning, you know, learning the tough lessons of the great recession and then coming out of the recession and being too conservative on uh, on the recovery end. That's why I, I was disagree- feel that. That's why I was disagree with Greg, uh, who isn't here today to defend himself about emergency funds. I just think too many people think oh, I don't need one of those, and I'm going to put all my money in the high, highest yield savings account, the stock market, and uh, then you you know lose your job at the same time the market goes down, and you don't have anywhere to go for cash. So, Greg and I will I think eternally disagree on the value of an emergency fund. Chris, how about yeah. you? Biggest biggest I'm- regret? Oops, Paula. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, I'm, I am pro-emergency fund. Absolutely. I'm pro having a large cash reserve. Yeah, I get what Greg is saying. I just think that it is, uh, you know, crossing your fingers and hoping everything goes okay. Uh. Yeah. Uh, Paul, uh, Paula, I just called on Paula. Uh, Chris, apparently you're the new Paula. What's, what's, what's uh, your biggest financial regret? It was on March 15th, 2008. Oh, that and was, it was, was the day, day that I... Didn't have the money for the wedding that I was going to be in because I was marrying my wife that day. So I put it on the only thing I had was a credit card. So I paid 22% interest on our wedding. On your entire wedding? A good portion of it. You see, when you're a, a dumb millennial like me, Joe, and you get engaged, you want to you wanna make sure you have the best wedding ever because we deserved it. So the uh, alcohol tab ran a little bit higher than we had expected. And yeah, it was a lot. A lot of money. And just put it on the credit card. Yeah. Uh, Pete, did you put your wedding on a credit card? No, I got married a month out of college. Like apparently, you know, while everything happens at once in life, and this happens to everyone, you, you get your job, you get a house, you get a car, you get married. That was me at 22. I had more hair and I was thinner and uh, yeah, it worked out well. They ran out of chicken for some of the guests, but I didn't care. I was married. <laughs> it didn't matter. Who cares if the guest gets chicken? It doesn't matter. Well, Chris is Chris is worried about the bigger thing, making sure everybody's sufficiently lubricated with alcohol, which absolutely applause to you, man. That's worth 22% interest right there. Well, they might have thought so. I didn't. <laughs> exactly. As long as you're buying, I'm happy that you're paying mm-hmm. 22% interest. Oh, this has been fun, but unfortunately, we got to put a cap on it. Let's, let's talk about what's going on where you guys all live. Paula, thanks for hanging out again another week here. What's going on at Afford Anything? Well, at that crazy Afford Anything podcast show, you and I get together to answer a bunch of listener questions. And it was people cr- have that to run run away from. I can't wait. To, I can't wait till people hear that because we got crazy. <laughs> we did. We uh, we got into it a little bit on traditional versus Roth four hundred one k contributions, which I totally yeah. won. I, t- I totally that won happened. that. I totally won that argument. Can't wait <laughs> for for people to hear that. And, and we have a bunch of unnecessary Burger King references too. Oh, absolutely. As we should. Yes. Amen. (laughs) We haven't had enough on this one. Chris Peach, thank you for filling in literally an hour before we were getting ready to record this baby. Like I told you, it got me out of gymnastics. (laughs) It was a no brainer. (laughs) So what's happening coming up here at the Money Peach podcast? Okay. So we have somebody on the podcast. He is coming on from Napa Valley. He owns a winery there. 
And he, um, very interesting guy, talks a lot about ketosis, the diet, keto diet, um, paleo diet. And he has the only wine right now in the United States that is paleo approved, keto approved. We have him coming on and then um, we just are getting ready to launch a new program. So we have our online program right now to show you everything about money and then we have a another one we're going to be launching here in about two months. Oh, that is so awesome. And uh, we're going to link to all this, everybody, on our show notes at stackybenjamins.com. Um, I'm so happy you could come on. We have to have you on more. I I can't believe it's been. How long has it been since you've been on the show? You know, it's funny you mentioned that. As I remember the last time I was on the show, you asked me what was going on. I said, we're going to start a podcast soon. <laughs> yeah, right. And we're almost a year into it. And so look at I, you now. I, I, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you could give me like a hour and a half notice that would <laughs> that would have been that would, that would have been way better and uh pete the planner only one question for you do you drink uh paleo approved wines no but i drink well hell i drink so much wine probably right i mean it, it's got to be in there uh i do love the wine yeah <laughs> tell us what's coming up at the at, at uh, the awesome million dollar plan podcast We've got a lot of uh, law enforcement and military folks coming oh. up on the podcast, which is uh, is interesting. They live different lives financially, and they have a lot different things to think about. And uh, this week's USA Today column, I talk about how to, well, why you should stop being a crappy client for your financial advisor. The financial advisors get a lot of crap, but the reality is half the problem is because people are terrible clients and they need to pull their head out of their porkopolis. That's a <laughs> that's a whole that's a whole another podcast. I think we have to have you on just to talk about that. Just you and I, because I think uh, together, I think we'd have some just horror stories of clients gone bad. Uh, I'm in. Clients gone wild, right? And we'll also link to the Million Dollar Plan podcast on our show notes at stackybenjamins.com. Hey guys, thanks a lot for playing. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, that's going to do it, everybody. But we've got more here at the end of the show. We're going to tell you a little bit about next week. Also going to tell you about the game we're playing. First, I'm going to tell you about magnifymoney.com because if you're the kind of person who comparison shops everything, you shop several stores for a new pair of jeans, you drive halfway across town to save two cents on gas, well, guess what? Why wouldn't you save on average $450, the average person that goes here, at Magnify Money? Whether it's a new checking account, better savings account, linking your checking and savings accounts, CDs, low interest credit cards, 0% interest credit cards to get that debt interest rate down, cashback rewards, whatever it is, stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. We use magnify money when my kids were just starting to get their credit together. We read Nick and the team at Magnify Money have a fantastic blog. They had a whole guide for people getting their first card. So both of my kids use that. Also, some good stuff at Magnify Money. Next Friday, we're going to have a roundtable about cars. There's a great piece up on the Magnify Money blog written by Mark Lagervist. This woman fell into a used car loan trap, and now she's fighting back talking about some stuff that uh, happened to her when she bought a used car from a not reputable dealer. We're going to talk about that next Friday, and we'll get to that here in a second. Well, you know what? Let's let's do that as soon as we talk about the game, because every Friday, OG isn't here. Obviously, you didn't hear him today. So I entertain myself by playing a game. And if you read either the description of the show, the name of the show, maybe listen to the first couple sentences that I say during the show, what you'll find is that something doesn't fit. And if you take every Friday show, and this time we started with the show May 12th, I've given you some clues and take those clues and put them together and uh, then solve the puzzle. I was uh, drinking some wine last night with my good friend, Mike, who listens to the show. And I told him the puzzle. And after I gave him a few clues, he got it. Not the hardest puzzle on earth. We had quite a few people guess last week the puzzle, and I'll tell them right now, nobody got it. But I think somebody might get it this week because you're all on the right track. Everybody uh, that sent me a clue is is on the right track. So not difficult. All right. Uh, the other thing is not difficult is for me to tell you about what's happening next week. Uh, just another horrible segue. Coming up on Monday, remember that big 
mailbag of letters that we have. We're going to go through a bunch of those on Monday. We're answering your letters. Of course, we'll still throw out the Haven Lifeline. We also have Karen Shinone from BlackRock uh, joining us during the headlines. A lot of people don't understand fixed income at all. And we ask her for some fixed income basics. Fixed income means bonds for the most part. So we're going to talk to Karen. Glad that she is able to uh, call us on Monday. On Wednesday, interesting study that was done recently called the Financial Diaries. These researchers followed people around for a month and had them write down all of their expenses. And this is uh, this shows some of the disturbing trends in finance. And we talk about what we can do about it. Incomes are up and down. Expenses sometimes uh, get out of whack. And some of the old advice that financial planners have given people doesn't seem to work. And so we talked to the authors of that study and of this book, Rachel Schneider and uh, Jonathan Mordock. And we'll talk to them on the shortwave on Wednesday. That's not all, though, of course. We're going to have some fun. And uh, next Thursday, remember, you can also now join us, uh, hashtag SB Live. We have a video chat, and uh, hopefully we'll have OG on this one. We're taking your questions. Yesterday, we had Nick Clements from Magnify Money on and had just a fantastic time. You can go back on our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash iStackBenjamins is our Facebook page, and you can watch yesterday's. We talked all things credit yesterday and nobody knows the dirty underbelly of credit like Nick Clements. And man, did he help a lot of people avoid some pitfalls yesterday with their credit. So check that out on the Facebook page. You can also join, by the way, our closed Facebook group. We have a lot of fun over there. That's uh, stackybedjamins.com forward slash green room. We call it the green room because, of course, we're making money, but it also is our behind-the-scenes chats. We ask them sometimes about upcoming stuff, share what we're thinking about the show, and uh, just generally have a lot of fun over there. Really like our group. We're up to going on 700 people in, in the green room. So we have we have some nice chats on Facebook. All right. Thanks again to everybody who's left a review of the show. That helps people find the show and understand what they're getting into with the Stacky Benjamin Show. Thanks to you for listening and uh, go Stacks and Benjamins. We'll see you on Monday. Special thanks to Chris Peach from the Money Peach Podcast. You can find more on his podcast at moneypeach.com. Thanks also to Pete the Planner from the Million Dollar Plan Podcast. You can find more on his podcast at petetheplanner.com. Paula Pant appears courtesy of affordanything.com. Thanks to Ryan Kuhn from Rentolutions. You can find more on them at rentolutions.com. And of course, we will have links to them all in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Kathleen Selmans handles design, newsletter, and classroom opportunities. If you'd like to learn more, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash classes. Online, visit us on Twitter at at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. Shannon Cowan is our community manager and social media guru. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I'm pretty much the guy in charge of everything around here. Trust me, this well-oiled machine didn't get like this all by itself. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. Join us Monday when we bring down the mailbag and answer your letters. See ya! What's wrong with you? Uh, It's either this show or indigestion. I hope it's indigestion. Why? It'll get better in a little while.